So, for several reasons, uh, this introduction is slightly different than I was expecting. Um, when I initially wrote this talk, I imagined that I was going to show you pictures like these of abandoned cityscapes, where we see that nature has kind of rewilded the, the place as humans are disappeared. And I was going to also talk about how this tends to happen because of a man-made crisis, such as the climate crisis. But then, um, in the space of two months, we've had two groundbreaking reports in regards uh, to climate change. The first one is from Cornell University that came out just two weeks ago. And it did a survey of over 88,000 studies um, over the last eight to 10 years. And it showed that there was over a 99% scientific consensus that climate change is man-made and happening right now. And in case you don't know, that is scientific certainty. You can never have 100%, but over 99% is as far as you'll get. And then two, two months ago, uh, the experts in climate change, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC, produced their groundbreaking report. And it said, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. And more importantly, many changes due to the past and future greenhouse gas emissions are reversible for centuries to millennia. This report took seven years to be made. It was signed by over a thousand scientists. And it basically says this, climate change is already happening, and without immediate global regulation, we risk making the entire planet an inhospitable home for humans and non-humans alike. So the reason I'm talking about this today is not probably to inform you about climate change. I'm sure you already know. But it's really to inform you about the lack of action that is happening in regards to climate change. The IPCC make it very clear we need to have net zero CO2 emissions in the coming decades, ideally by the end of this decade. And even if we do that, we're still not going to fix the climate crisis. They say that global surface temperatures will continue to increase until at least the mid-century under all scenarios. And global warming of 1.5 to 2% will be exceeded during the 21st century unless we have major reductions in greenhouse gas. And yet the fact is, is we're still not seeing the action that is needed. Um, this week, uh, my home country will be hosting the UN uh, climate conference, the biggest climate conference in the world. And yet the government said on Sunday that reaching net zero by 2050, not even 2030, is almost entirely not going to happen. That's a problem. And we see that there is a massive disconnect between expert advice and societal-wide action. And that's what I study. I'm a professor of rhetoric here at Aarhus University in Denmark. And I study this disconnect between expert advice and uh, political action. And in particular, I look at how we can repair this disconnect between the two through various uh, communication strategies. And in particular, I look at the role that ideology plays in making effective communication strategies in order to see actual action. So in order to begin to understand why we're not seeing the action that is needed, I want to begin with the theory on um, the science of climate communication. And it's this issue called the information deficit. So the information deficit uh, has developed over the last 50 years. And it was saying that climate change communication isn't happening for two reasons. Because there was a lack of clear information from experts and there was a lack of public understanding of this information. And then it focused on how we can improve the transfer of information from experts to non-experts. But the thing is, is we've had 50 years of consistent messaging about the climate crisis. So we cannot really argue that there is an information deficit anymore. 
So the question is, is what is happening? And in order to answer that, I'm going to begin um, with this little picture um, of Star Wars characters from Lego, which is very appropriate for Denmark. And I want to go back towards the concerns of ideology and the fact that the climate crisis isn't an information problem, but it's one of a, it's a cultural problem. And it's part of something called the culture wars. And the culture wars is a term that developed in the 1980s and it explores that in society, the big issues of the time, gender rights, abortion, climate change, all these big issues um, tend to develop a conflict between different social groups who strongly identify with certain beliefs, morals, and values. And these beliefs, values, and morals influence their understanding of these kind of hot topics of the day. And it creates an ever-growing divide between groups. And this is partly because of the way that people process information. Uh, there's a lot of climate psychology that explores this. One concept is that humans are boundedly rational or that we're cognitive misers. We do not like to take in information that doesn't align with our uh, previous ideology and we try to understand things in the simplest of terms. And so this means that um, we tend to associate we tend to believe our ideological beliefs more than new information that opposes these beliefs that develop through the culture wars. And critically, when ideologies are challenged, people often double down on their beliefs. So climate psychology says, in order to change the way that we think about the climate, we need to change the status quo. But this becomes too difficult because of the way that we process new information. So here I say we don't have an information deficit in regards to the climate. We know what's happening and we know what we need to do. Instead, we have a deficit in persuading people to act against their own cognitive interests. And this is why I'm saying the climate crisis is a communication crisis. So the question is, is what do we do now? I've given you some pretty uh, miserable information, but there are some solutions. And my proposed solution is what I call the three I's. And it's a communication strategy that involves ideology. And the first one is identification. So um, psychology alongside rhetoric and many of the social sciences say that in order to persuade people, we actually need to identify with each other and we need to find commonalities. And one way we can do this is to present people with a pretty simple question. Have we, seen as a, have we as a species grown to such numbers and has our technology grown to such power that we can alter and manage the ecosystem on a planetary scale? If the answer is yes, which the answer is yes, then we've identified our first commonality. We can all agree that we've got a problem. And this reframes climate change as a global problem rather than an individual one. And it moves us from an I to a we culture. We need to solve the climate crisis. So the first one is identification. And once we're identifying with each other and agreeing on that, then we need some informative information. So we're going to center familiarity here. And in order to do that, we're going to have something called what Pilker called a broker. And we're going to use different communication strategies um, to sort of build this familiarity. So we're going to use familiar communication systems using familiar media. That might be narratives, metaphors, uh, stories. It will be using the common media of the day. And we're going to use concrete examples instead of abstract examples. And we're also going to have a familiar communicator, someone that speaks to both sides of the divide. And then we're also going to frame information about the climate, con climate crisis. And we need it to be framed 
consistently with the status quo. That's why we see things like the Green New Deal. We continue this framework of concern about jobs and the economy, but we sort of slightly adapt it in order to now fit the, the narrative of the climate crisis. And we're going to prioritize gain over loss. We're going to frame that the development of climate strategies is a gain for society rather than a loss, because the gain is, is that we don't see a, um, a completely inhospitable world that we can no longer live in. And then the third thing we're going to do is we're going to imagine. So we need to think of what our new future is and what kind of society we want to live in. As Kashmina, Perforce, Ferdinand and Pat Patendine said, when the environment is changing dynamically, sorting out a vision for our collective future via political discourse is an inevitable part of this adaptation process. So we need to imagine a collective future where we live with climate change to an extent or maybe even without the drastic climate change that is predicted. And again, we need to prescribe understandable action and tangible action. And we need to use familiar concepts that align with these expert recommendations, which is this net zero. But the thing is, in order to do that, we need to have some way in which we present this information. And Pilker said that we needed what's called an honest broker who integrates scientific knowledge with stakeholder concerns to explore alternative possible courses of action. And really, this was initially designed, this honest broker, to be a person. So you would want someone that is familiar to the groups that you're trying to persuade and convince about climate change. But the thing is, is familiar persons and persons we agree with, or even language, that's all very subjective. So I want to pose a different type of honest broker. And in order to do that, I'm going to go back to what my introduction looked like, which was where um, I showed nature flourishing when humans disappear. We might see that in abandoned places like Chernobyl, but we also, see, we also saw nature flourishing, ironically, during the COVID-19 lockdowns. In that short space of time that people weren't intervening on the planet so much, we weren't having as much emissions, we weren't generally doing as many things that hurt the climate, we saw some incredible results. We saw some funny results where in Wales, sheep were seen on children's playgrounds and on roundabouts. And we got loads of reports, some that were fake news and some that weren't, of animals enjoying these human spaces that now they could roam in because humans weren't there. But we also got some really good figures. The daily global CO2 emissions decreased by 17% by early April two, uh, 2020. And this is compared with 2019 levels. And just under half of these were changes from surface transport, so not using as much um, fossil fuels. And at their peak, emissions in individual countries decreased by about 26%. That is an incredible uh, amount of decrease in such a short space of time. Now, the thing is, is we're not going to see those decreases in emissions really having a lasting effect because it you know we're sort of coming out of lockdown now in various stages in various countries but the thing is is we have seen examples of where nature has continued to flourish after some sort of man-made apocalyptic event that is more than just the COVID-19 lockdowns and the example I've got here is actually the former Iron Curtain and this was the physical divide of Europe uh, during the Cold War. And um, this Iron Curtain created a no man's land. And during the 40 years that it existed, we actually saw this literal green belt develop across Europe. And this continues to this day. 
uh, the 24 countries that were affected by the Iron Curtain have now developed this 24 country wide biodiversity conservation program that is like the pinnacle of the EU and we are allowing nature to flourish there. We're allowing uh, animals that no longer existed to come back into Europe. Um, we're rewilding the continent. So the reason I'm showing you this is I'm saying that rather than perhaps using language or people to be these honest brokers, to convince people that we need to act, what about if we use this flourishing nature to be the honest broker itself? So what nature can do is, I want to go back to my three eyes, and the first one is identification. Nature is familiar to us all, and it goes beyond language. We're all familiar with it, and it creates kind of a, like a literal anchor between people, community, spaces, and identity even. And what nature does, this flourishing nature, is it becomes a literal argument that shows when humans don't do so much on a planet or on, in a city or in a space that it flourishes and it starts to rewrite its ecosystems. And this is an argument that you can't refute. It is actual proof of the damage that we do just by living and using general fossil fuels, etc., etc. So... It then also allows us to imagine what a new future could be like, where we sort of live more in harmony, where we, with the environment, we don't use as many fossil fuels, and generally it becomes a way that we can imagine the future. And this is what I'm proposing, is that we start using nature as this honor bro honest broker itself, and nature becomes nurture, because, as Anna Singh said, in a global state of precarity, we don't have any choices than looking for life in this ruin. Thank you.